Hello, today I'm going to be interviewing Chad. How are you doing, Chad? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I uh, just got a bit of a cold. I think you got a cold as well, haven't you? Yep, sure do. Yeah, do you get this often? No, this is super rare. Yeah. You got good vitality then? Yeah, I think so. Or at least, at least I'd like to think so. Mm, that's good. Now, I'm not, not sure if all my viewers know who Chad is. I imagine quite a few people do, though, especially in the MBTI community. Chad runs, um, has run MBTV. I think you also um, you do coaching, don't you, Chad? I did. I, I'm currently out of that business right now. So, What motivated the change? I wanted to work in more of a startup environment. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do offline for a while. So that's kind of where I am. Hmm. I like yeah. the concept yeah. of traditional business. Oh, I see. So what is it about business that you found attractive? Leadership. Mm -hmm. Working by yourself uh, can be not fun for me. It's definitely not. I like working with people. I like being able to synergize with teams. It's really fun for me. I see. So you say that for you, the dream job is not really to be working by yourself, not really to be working so independently. You'd rather be engaging with other people. Correct. Mm -hmm. As long as I'm engaging with other people, I'm I'm in a good position. Mm. So where do you would you say you see yourself in the next, say, five years uh, going into startups? I would be running my own startup. Uh, it would be hopefully 50 employees or more. 50 employees? That would be ideal. Mm. Oh, good. Do you, so you said about also you like the leadership. So you, you say you see yourself as a leader. Yes. Mm. And what would you say are the characteristics you have that makes you feel that you are a good leader? Well, the, the, the question is good or effective, right? So mm -hmm. I always continue to, I know that I'm a student and I continue to learn. That's one of my biggest things is always learning more. Mm -hmm. and trying to be humble through the process. Life has taught me very grand lessons of humility, taste mm -hmm. of humble pie, getting your butt handed to you. So I've always appreciated those lessons. So for me, being a good leader is someone who's open-minded enough to know where they're wrong, but mm -hmm. also being able to take input and being able to coordinate decisions and execute decisions as quickly as possible in most circumstances. Although some decisions do need patience and to take in the data, for me, it's about being able to make decisive decisions and hold yourself responsible and accountable for the outcome, regardless of who actually executes it or not. It's taking accountability and responsibility for those decisions. Mm. That's just a small fraction. I could talk all day about leadership, but uh, <laughs> accountability is huge for me. I think that's one of the biggest things is we're we need to take accountability for our actions in general. And being able to do that for a team outside yourself or your family or whatever it is that you're trying to lead, I think that those are huge things that indicate uh, positive leadership. Mm, so, le so leadership, so we summarize as accountability, responsibility, humility, including the ability to change one's mind. Yes. And then influence, of course, is a big aspect of that as well, being able to influence others. Mm. Why did you not mention influence until after you mentioned accountability, responsibility, and the ability to change one's mind? I naturally assumed it was a given, but then I realized it probably wasn't a given for a lot of people. Being able to influence mm. others, I think, is huge, though. Mm. Makes sense. And what would you say are the ways in which you see yourself being most influential? Uh, expertise, knowledge, ability to move, make quick decisions, and take hold myself accountable. It goes mm. back to accountability. Would you say that you um, find it easy to make decisions very quickly? Or would you say that you're more of a sort of person who thinks before doing? I just do. I execute quickly. Mm. See, you do seem more, uh, you don't mind me saying, you also are very fast in your answers. Like it comes to you very quickly. Right. Mm. That makes sense. I tend to think, I tend to speak before I think in a lot of circumstances, which gets me in trouble sometimes, but then I mm. speak my way out of it, so. Yeah. Hmm. Would you say that, how, what would you say is a good example, say an emergency scenario where you put your quick thinking to good use? Uh, emergency, that's a, can you elaborate? What do you mean by well, emergency? Like a crisis scenario, somewhere where quick thinking is of the essence. What were you able to do? Oh, like a real life example, like something yeah. that actually happened? Okay, so I was running a fitness camp. Uh, mm -hmm. probably five, six years ago. And this is just one of the many examples. But mm -hmm. when in a crisis scenario, things really slow down for me. 
and it seems to be going in slow motion. My, I guess my alert, my attentiveness kicks in and it, I tend to get in the zone or flow state. Mm -hmm. So it's more relaxing to me in a crisis situation than regular life, I guess. So the example is five or six years ago, probably more now. Yeah, I'd say five years ago, I was running this fitness camp. And ultimately what happened was that one of the people had uh, pushed themselves too hard, overexerted themselves and started having a hyperventilating and having a panic attack while hyperventilating. While everybody else was freaking out. I was able to calm that person down and take immediate control of the situation and not have to escalate the situation further and able to get that person out of it while remaining calm the entire time. Hmm. And so I think that that has a lot to do with the ability to remain calm in crisis situations. And it's very, very frequent for me. Same with car accidents or anything. It's like things slow down for me quite, quite frequently. Hmm. And you say that's a, a position of great confidence for you, that you don't, you, 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 talk, do you take that for granted or has there been any time where that hasn't worked out for you? as you'd have liked. I, uh, it almost always works out for me. Okay. That's good. Um, now, as, as I said before, before you were moved to a startup, you were a coach. What made you want to be a coach? I like the uh, idea of empowering others. Mm -hmm. I think I was a little misguided in the decision though. I think I was wanting to be a coach because I was looking to, um, help others, but I think it was just so much of a, small scale that I didn't really enjoy the one on one. I'm I like public speaking. I like really big, large groups of people. So for me, the one on one was too slow and I didn't enjoy that aspect. I did enjoy the results I was able to produce, but I did not enjoy uh, the one on one enough. And I really wanted to pursue something I could scale. So do you say that you're more of a performer? Uh, yes, uh, definitely a public speaker. Hmm, public speaker. So um, why did you hesitate when I said performer? Because I thought immediately of like art, art, like dance. And I'm not I'm not an artist. I wouldn't call myself an artist. Hmm. I would definitely call myself, though, a public speaker and someone who is very comfortable on stage. OK, so co comfortable speaking in the in the public eye, um, not someone who just wants to say entertain. Correct. Was art. Right. It's with a purpose. I don't like doing pointless entertainment. I'm not a mm. court jester, you know, like yeah. my job is to get the information out or whatever it is that the, the purpose of the presentation is and to do that as efficiently as possible, but also to have fun while doing it and able to motivate or influence crowds, which is what I really like to do. I see. So what well, one thing that makes me wonder there, what caused you to choose startup rather than say going towards motivational speaking? Well, that could be included in the startup, but mm -hmm. I've shied away from motivational speaking because I haven't seen the success that I'd like to see before I got into motivational speaking. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So you, would you, does that mean that motivational speak is more of a future possibility? Definitely. Mm, I see. Um, I'm geared, I volunteer in this information, but politics is where my mind is always. So really moving into the political arena is probably where I'm going to ah. Wonderful. So going towards maybe governorship, se um, senator? We'll find out. I see. Very good. Um, now I dabbled a little bit in politics myself. Um, hmm, let me think. Oh, okay, so you mentioned empowerment. So what is empowerment to you? Being able to bring others to their own level of accountability and, and responsibility, giving them power to be able to execute that things that they want to do and they tend to get in their own way. But to me, mm -hmm. it's like I don't, I'm less on depending on others and being able to muster the energy or force to do it yourself. And I feel that a lot of people can't do that. They have really big challenges of being able to get things done on their own. So teaching them how to figure out a way to make those things a reality, especially when it comes to goal attainment, is huge for me. How can I help this person achieve their goals? Mm. Okay. So it is literally the, the, the power to achieve what you set out to do and not Correct. rely on others for it. Hmm. Yep. Makes sense. Um, but it's interesting there that you have the theme of getting people to be able to do things better themselves. At the same time, you're not someone who is comfortable just working on your own, but you want, want to be involved and connected with other people. Correct. It's like I can still do the things on my own, but I enjoy the fun of being able to work and brainstorm with other people. Hmm. I don't feel the need to depend on others to get a job done. I'll do it my, on my own, which I've done my whole life, but I much more enjoy working with other people and allowing their ideas 
to come and create synergy with my own. Hmm. And also appreciate the idea of not being the smartest person in the room and having other people build me up too. Hmm. What would uh, be a good example of you creating synergy with someone else? Say that we're working on a business idea and I have a concept that I'm working with and they're able to chime in. How would that concept go to market easier with a certain angle or perception or this creative way to go to market for less? I was thinking about, say, running social media ads and paying, you know, $80 a lead or $50 a lead. And they find a way to do guerrilla style marketing that I've never thought of before. And mm -hmm. they are able to drop my cost per lead to save $5 and we can get the same quality out of that lead. Hmm. So it's all just putting different ideas together. Some people be giving some crit maybe some criticism or some different feedback and that allows your idea to become or synthesized to become better. Correct. Hmm. Makes sense. Now, you also say that you are so sort of comfortable not being the smartest person in the room. So what, what I would say to that is how, what, how are we able to identify who is the smartest person in the room? And what do you tend to do when you do encounter such a person? Well, it depends on the subject. If it, it again, if it's a subject that matter, I always, I never want to be the smartest person on the subject in the room. I feel like I need to get a better group. Right. If I, if that's the case. So I would identify the person a who sent seems to have more of the ability to have done it or they have the most subject matter or subject knowledge on it. And mm -hmm. so it's those two that are kind of distinguishers for me. Have you actually done what you've, you're saying you're, you're able to do or you can do with this method that you're teaching or somebody who seems to have a good grasp and they're moving in that direction and they've shown positive track hist or track a positive track toward that outcome rather. Mm. Okay. Now let's, let's, let's cut a bit away from sort of a career and ambition side. Let's go to more, more what you do when you're not at work. What do you say your favorite activities when you're not working? Oh, uh, well, that's, I have a lot of activities. Favorite is hard to narrow that down. It depends on the season, mm -hmm. but usually anything that involves physical activity. So I like shooting. I like exercising. I get up at four forty-five every morning, go to the mm -hmm. gym. I like eating right. I like skiing. I like scuba diving, skydiving, anything crazy or fun that puts my adrenaline at the edge. I really like that. Mm -hmm. ah, so all high octane, high intensity. Yep, like cars, I got about an 800 horsepower vehicle. So yeah, anything that's fast, powerful, speed, you name it. It's, mm. I really appreciate the, uh, how exciting those things can be for me. I must say your dog looks a lot more relaxed in terms of his leisure activities than you are. Oh, my dog is completely chill. He's the complete opposite. He does not bark, he just hangs out. Ah, oh, he's cute. Well, what's the breed? I'm not sure of the breed. He's actually a mix between Poodle and Shih Tzu. Oh, adorable. What's his name? Sammy. Ah, hey, Sammy. <laughs> so and so there is definitely a clear theme there in terms of pursuit of intensity. Does it ever get too much for you? Do you ever tie, tie yourself out or weigh yourself down? No. Okay, so pretty resilient as well. Yeah, I, I, I just enjoy it. It's like there, it, it's one of the, I get more relaxed in intensity. Like to me, it's like more of a flow state. Hmm. I see. Hmm. That makes sense. Um, hmm. Would you say that these, these activities don't necessarily sound too social? Uh, do you tend to go, um, do these activities with other people? Or do you didn't do it on your own. Mainly I like to do it with myself mostly because most people don't want to do a lot of the things that I like to do. <laughs> but I mean, if they want to go to go, I would have much more fun with other people than I would by myself. Okay. So why, or if you prefer to have it with, have your fun with other people rather than do it by yourself, um, why haven't you been able to persuade people to come along and do these things with you? I don't care to persuade them. It's like, if they want to go great, uh, if not, that's fine too. Hmm. It's, no need to persuade people to do things they don't want to do if it's something that i don't feel is if it's recreational now if it's a business i might try to persuade somebody if they have a skill set that i need mm. but as far as recreation no because the chances are they won't want to do it then i'm gonna to have to take the bill and i'm not taking the bill so <laughs> i see <laughs> yeah fair enough would you say that although you see yourself as being a good influencer you're not inclined to persuade people to do things they don't wouldn't otherwise want to do 
as long as it doesn't pertain to one of my goals. My goal, my recreation is my out, it's my outlet for stress. Some people just stresses them out. Whereas for me, it's my outlet. Some people just don't want to do recreational stuff and I get it. So I don't want to, you know, I don't feel the need to influence them to do something they don't want to do when it comes to that. But if it's one of my goals and that person's standing in the way, then they're going to help me and I'm going to influence them any way I can. Hmm. Would you say that your son has a large number of friends outside of work? No. Hmm. Would you say you, I know you do have um, certain your friends are, who are involved in MBTV. Um, would you say you would keep more of a close knit circle? Uh, no, I don't really keep anybody close. Mm. Why is that? Uh, I don't know. I'm still working on that. I'm not really good at keeping close ties. Like people are seasonal to me. Hmm. What do you mean by seasonal? They come and they go. It's like, I don't really see long lasting relationships as super long lasting. And I feel that most people are pretty self-indulgent. And after a period of time, they find their own interest and we go our separate ways. And that's fine. Shake hands, walk away. Hmm. The, the shaking of the hands seems slightly corporate in a way, as it were. It's like it's there's, there's a formality to it. There is. To me, there is, yes. Hmm. It doesn't have to get ugly. Just, all right, great. Hmm. So like no, a business no, transaction. So, so it's almost like friendships are, are transitory um, and they also are transient and also there isn't very much hard feelings at the end of it. It's expected to not last forever and you don't get so caught up in the friendship that it hurts so much when it does break off. Oh, yeah, it doesn't hurt at all to me. I mean, uh, other than if I lost my girlfriend, I don't think I'd be affected much. Mm. And I think that mainly the the act of separating is more painful than the lasting effects of it. So it's like during the, the, the separation act, I may feel that it, the reason why we're separating is justified. And of course, some people are resistant to change. And if they're resistant to change, it puts a lot of pressure in the sense of saying, look, do I really want to be nice and just let this thing last? No, probably not. And then I have to push through that, which isn't super painful, but I guess that's the more painful part. Mm -hmm. uh, the only really close relationship I have, like super close is my relationship with my girlfriend. My close friends that I've had for 10 plus years, uh, I would say that there's a lot of things they don't know about me. Hmm. I'm very private when it comes to really personal, intimate stuff. So I don't, I don't think there's not a lot shared. But what, what, what um, motivates that privacy? No, that I don't know the answer to. If I had it, I would let you know. But I honestly don't. I haven't explored the reasons why there's so many barriers to intimacy, but from one, it seems that it doesn't matter to me to sh to have these close, personal, intimate relationships that much to me. Hmm. Um, go ahead. I would you say it's not uh, a fear of being hurt. Correct. I, I don't feel like I'm going to get hurt by having people close. I just don't feel like I need it, if that makes sense. That makes sense. Very much so. Um, and now... One thing I'm curious to explore, I guess, because to, to, be, to be to be open here, I um, it's, it's something which I have often experienced for myself. But I've often wondered how others may relate to that, especially in regards to your girlfriend and having that that one person. And um, how does it change when approaching your girlfriend? I I think it's because she earned it. If I were to really put it that way, she she earned it. Like it was like. When I was in my worst moments, going through whatever depression, uh, sadness, anxiety, stress, I tend to use my force and aggression in not so positive ways. Mm -hmm. And she's able to trudge through my emotions and work with me. And that allowed me to uh, reciprocate in a way that nobody else has been able to get past. Mm -hmm. But and I, that, that's what I really enjoy about that one relationship, but it's also something special. It's just the one that's the, the one that matters to me. But the, the, the question is now that I have it, I wouldn't be as happy without it, but had I never known it, then I'd, I'd be okay. If that makes sense. Hmm. Okay. So in other words, it's 
because it happened, it makes sense and it fits together and it's meaningful. Right. And I don't want to lose it. I, I really enjoy having her in my life. She's huge to me. She's mm -hmm. huge to my life and she's a great, great, valuable person to have. And I enjoy actually loving her. So that's important to me. Now, you said that you went through um, you went through periods of emotional depression. Was this is this more of a more of a chronic um, issue or is it more of a sort of a periodic um, issue? Uh, chronic meaning you it it's pretty much on all the time or yeah. periodic as in just episodes yes chronic okay, is so, pretty much yeah. a, a recurring issue is it more about at certain times in your life you've had de depressive episodes yeah so i've probably been, had depressive episodes maybe five or six times throughout my entire life mm -hmm. and so probably once every five to six years mm -hmm. minus my childhood where i felt like maybe i was constantly depressed but it's hard to remember back then I don't really pay attention to the past too much, kind of ignore that. Uh, but I would say that, yeah, I think that it, it, it's been on and off. Primarily, it's been related to what is it that I'm going to do? I think if, sometimes it's a lack of vision, I think. Mm -hmm. It's like I've been able to do whatever I want to do, but now what is it that I really want to do? I think that's where the, the challenge has been. Hmm. I think that, that that would certainly fit and make sense. Um, would you, as we say, we would say it's a depression brought on by certain conditions rather than something that is chemical. Correct. I don't think it's chemical at all. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Makes sense. And what, what, how would you describe the, the feeling when you don't know where things are going? You don't know where the vision is, what things are meant to be leading to. I have all this capability and I'm not doing anything with it. I don't like that. So and like, potential. yeah, go. Cool. Yep. And not being able to cultivate potential, not being able to uh, push a uh, push some kind of agenda forward, not being in action, but staying in a state of inertia because I don't know what the hell to do. I don't like that. I don't generally get in inertia, but at those times in my life, I feel like I'm, what am I supposed to do? I can do anything. I can go outside and run 10 miles if I want, but why? It gets to this point of I can do it, but why? And that's where I've learned this last this last one that happened a few years ago. What I learned out of it was the only thing that gets me out of those is physical activity. I just go back to doing the things that I love doing, and it kind of just shakes it off. Hmm. No, you, you answered my question before I asked it. Yes, it, may, it makes sense that when you have that that pent up energy, that will to act, as it were, you have to channel it somewhere. And if you don't have the vision to motivate it towards you. You let it out through physical activity. Yeah, that's that's what's fixed it is in those times where you you may not be able to control everything. It's like I used to be try to control everything. And then as I've learned through age that more and more is not in my control, which has been a harsh reality in a lot of ways. But mm -hmm. I've always tried to push my agenda forward no matter what. And I still don't quit. But, you know, just learn to grow up, I guess, in a way. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. What sort of things did you try to control when you were younger? people mainly people but all, also elements um, try to put control on but yeah i was i was very highly manipulative when i was a teen hmm. and i would get in people's heads i would uh, sabotage relationships i would sabotage people and their their goals and i thought it was fun i used to just terrorize people and i didn't realize how much of a mental terrorist i was at the time but hmm. looking back i realized i was a pretty big mental terrorist Mm. and you know that's what it is so you said you said it was fun what, what what were you trying to do i guess i just liked the fact that i could i could ex will i could control i guess i could i just really enjoyed the fact that i could break things and mm. and i could do it with my words or i could do it with my physical strength or i could do it in any way possible and i had outbursts of rage i used to be destructive mm. I, I used to be, you know, I still, I still have those feelings, but I've learned to control them with age, of course, mm -hmm. but I still deal with high levels of anger, of course. But I mean, other than that, no, I, I just think that I enjoyed being able to break things and show that I could influence anything I wanted. Like when to, when I was a teen and I'm not proud of this by any means. And I want to d throw a disclaimer out there. No, but I must say I admire the honesty and I think it's the honesty, which is admirable here. Yeah. So, uh, 
I would see a successful relationship and I would personally go out there and see if I could break it. If it's so strong, let me see how strong it is. Let me test my will against it. Let's mm. see how well I can break it. Oh, you want to brag about how strong it is, right? Well, let's see if I can break it. Mm. So it's like I always wanted to pit my ability against what was the strongest foe. And when I was in boxing, I would do this physically. I'd, bo I'd box people three times my weight class. Mm. And I would get hammered a lot and I got hit hard. But I enjoyed being able to be way outmatched and I'd like testing my might. And mm. that's what I really enjoyed was just being in the thrill of testing my ability. That makes sense. You... You, you also said that you used to have rages. And, I and, still and, do, yeah. but I don't express them as much as I used to. What sets off those rages? Uh, anything. <laughs> 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 anything. Um, primarily if uh, I feel there's too much. F uh, let me think. In a business setting, it's going to be set off. My irritability is going to be set off by too much bureaucracy, mm. too much formality. Uh, if the rules are stupid, I'm going to break them. And I think that policy is stupid and I'm going to say something about it and I'm going to fix it. I'm going to break it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's in a business setting in a personal setting. It's more the fact that I think it's if I'm not being heard or I'm not getting my way. So it's still a childish fit. Of course I swallow the rage and I'll try to shut up and not let it express, but I mm -hmm. still have my faults and it comes out sometimes, but it's not physically destructive. Mm. I just tend to raise my voice now, and uh, then I catch myself, and I'm able to bring myself back down. Mm. Makes sense. There's um, now you said that when you see things in the workplace, which you see as stupid. What is an example of something being stupid in this sort of bureaucratic sense? Uh, for example, ten things that get in the way that have nothing to do, let's say, with an, a particular outcome that one is cert, cert seeking. One wants to seek this outcome. But, okay, here's a better example. You have an agenda for a meeting, right? Yeah. And it has these 10 topics on here, these things that we need to cover. If those topics, if the say that the conversation is straying away from those and everybody's getting in side topics and getting into too much, let's say, points that are irrelevant to what we're trying to accomplish, I'm going to start feeling irritated. It's like, mm -hmm. I want the meeting to be as short as possible. Let's get the stuff out. Let's move on. Let's get our, let's get back in action. Let's not sit around mm -hmm. this table for 25 minutes when we could be here for five. Yeah. And so it's, I have a lot, I have a very large lack of patience, I guess is the way to put it. It's if it, if there's too many policies or rules or stipulations in place that prevent outcome, then I get kind of annoyed with those processes. Hmm. Would you say that you tend to avoid creating rules yourself? No, I, I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, would you say that, given this is this sort of approach to rules, you seem you're comfortable with rules as long as you don't feel restricted by them? If they're my rules, I'm comfortable with them. Ah. Okay, right. So as long as you're making the rules, as long as you're calling those shots, it's all yep. right. And you can have as we say as much structure as you want then. Yep. I'm big on structure. I structure everything in my own life and I follow my own rules. But mm -hmm. when someone else tries to put rules on me, I tend to break them if I find them to be inefficient or in my way. Hmm. Makes sense. I can see sort of the priority there as well, that the rules are serving, as it were. You being the, being the boss, as it were, you getting what you, getting what you need, not letting yep. things get in your way, makes yeah. sense. Hmm. Um, and it's interesting, when it came to now, I know you started with MBTI, and social has become more more of a new thing for you. Would you say that's correct? Yeah, I admittedly don't know much about it. I know a little bit. I know enough to be dangerous, but and there's <laughs> also all these taxonomies which different people have different ideas like WSS is different from, you know, model a standard model a anyway. And, and so there's just so many different taxonomies that I just had don't hadn't had the time to really dive into each one and really look at it and go, this is the one that I want to read up on. And I tend to kind of accept that their own, each taxonomy is legit in its own system. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, that's why I'm not attached to my type at all. I may be one type in another system and another type in another system. I don't really care. Mm. Right. 
Okay. It's, all, it's all fine by me. But I guess what uh, my question is about when it comes to be, being approached by these different taxonomies, would you say that you, you are okay with them, but you don't feel that they're restricted by them? Right. I don't feel like, uh, let me, let me clarify. Let me actually ask you actually, when you say restricted, what do you mean by that? Well, for instance, that, you know, like something could be underpinning your identity or stamp it down and, it, and maybe limit you and what you could be and what you could become. No, that's silly to me. Hmm. Why? Uh, I think that uh, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> I guess that it comes from a, a, a sense of arrogance for the most part. I don't I don't want to call it arrogance because I'd like to think that I'm learning as I get older, but mm -hmm. I don't feel that I'm I know where I'm limited. And when someone tells me I'm limited in an area that I know I'm not limited, it's not going to bother me. Now, if they say something that I'm limited in which I'm aware of which I'm limited, then I don't doesn't bother me either because I'm aware of it. So it doesn't really bother me. I don't I don't find it often if somebody say, hey, you're not going to be able to say succeed in this area. I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right. Nor do I want to, you know, like it's not really a, something that I feel I need to be successful in. Hmm. Is there anything which you do find uh, sort of intimidating? Yeah, intimacy. Hmm. Closeness is intimidating in its own way. I, it's not because I feel like I'm going to get hurt. It's just I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. Hmm. What would be, say, an example where you wouldn't know what you're doing with intimacy? What other how, do, how do I make somebody feel comfortable? Like, how do I make somebody... Uh, how do I show a feeling that I have if I don't know what that feeling is or... How do I sort out my own feelings? I don't know. I half the time I don't even know what I'm feeling. Mm. So it's it's really difficult. So if I feel that somebody else says I'm sad, I have to like figure out what's making them sad, and then I know that my first response is usually wrong. So I have to sit back and figure out what it is that I need to say. Yeah, it's it's very mechanical to me. It's like, what is what is it I need to say to make this person feel better? And it becomes less about listening and more about like systematically trying to solve this person's problem. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't tend to work sometimes. Sometimes people just want to be heard. They don't want their problems solved. And that tends to be an issue for me as well. Hmm. That makes sense. So say you get frustrated if someone doesn't want their problems to actually be solved. Yeah, or I get frustrated if I feel like I can't solve their problem because I've been so independent my whole life. I've been able to solve my issues for the most part. There's some that still can be challenging, of course, but and I just can't solve other people's problems in the emotional arena. It makes it makes me feel a little incompetent sometimes. Like, dude, I am emotionally incompetent. And sometimes I'm aware of that. Like I feel like a big baby sometimes. And I'm like, wow, okay, you're a big baby in the arena of the emotional ability to and it's not that i get upset about it per se it's just like i know that i suck at it really bad and i'm like dude that's pretty childish like why do i suck at this although if it's a if, it, if it's emotional com incompetence as you say how did you manage with coaching for and how long were you coaching for because it's mechanical uh, yeah. i coached for about two and a half years and psychology is to me is a system and knowing that system you know there's a particular problem i did not counsel people Mm -hmm. I solve their problems with NLP, which is different. It's a technique. Okay. It's an ability to be able to remap cartography of your mind versus, mm -hmm. hey, here's how you navigate through that childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. If you were to tell me today I had this childhood trauma, I have no idea what to say. I would be, okay. <laughs> I, it's That's how dumb I feel about it. And I, I'm not embarrassed about it. It's like, dude, I suck at it. Okay, fine, whatever. Like, it, I don't know the answer. Or if somebody has a death in the family, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not, I, I feel like I need to appropriately say I'm sorry, but I don't know what actually to say. Mm. Or somebody's death of a close one, I'm like, wow, I'm sorry to hear, hear that. Now get back to work. It's not really emotionally intelligent, yeah. you know? And I, I'm aware of that. And I, it's like, uh, you know, uh, you can't be good at everything. And that's kind of the area that I feel pretty incompetent in, but it's not like it's, it makes me feel like I'm inferior. It's just, I know that every human has weaknesses and that's my area of non-strength, I guess I'll call it. Hmm. 
I do wonder, but what, wouldn't the NLP have some sort of solution for these situations? It does, and it's it takes a work and takes a lot of practice, but you, it's really hard to NLP yourself. Oh, no, I, no, I meant more for handling, um, say, the loss of a loved one. Oh, yeah, yeah. There is techniques for that. I'm just talking about in an example, like, say, mm -hmm. in a business setting, and I'm not working as an NLP coach. What do you say? You know, that uh, was just a hypothetical example. And I don't send like thank you cards. I don't do any of the, I don't send, you know, any of that stuff. My girlfriend has to beg me to write like cards and stuff that I don't want to write, but I'll do it because she asked me to, hmm. you know, I just do it reluctantly. And she kind of takes care of the whole, she manages the whole relationship side of most of my relationships. She's better at keeping up with my friends than me. Oh, you yeah, know, that, that's, uh, I, that's certainly a familiarity. <laughs> yeah. She keeps um, up with my friends more than I do. It's crazy. Like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> my, my, my fiance is the same. Like, I don't know what my family are getting up to. My, my fiance knows. Yeah. I didn't talk to my mom. Probably. I haven't talked to my mom in two and a half years, probably. And I haven't talked to my dad, in maybe six, seven months. Hmm. I mean, it's my brother, same thing. I mean, it, and if we do talk, it's not very long and it's pretty superficial. And then we move on. It's just like, and I don't know. Sometimes I guess it, it feels like, it felt like the longest time I was incapable of loving people, but then I realized I just love in my own way, which is very mm -hmm. different than what other people judge it as. What, what would you say is your way? Making them better by being able to, to help them in other ways, not necessarily emotionally comforting people or giving them what they want. Mm -hmm. And if somebody tries to tell me, Hey, I need you to call me like hypothetically, if somebody said, look, I want to, in order to know that you, love me you need to call me every month i'm not going to do that i'm going to do the exact opposite hmm. and it's i don't i guess i don't like being commanded in that way either it's like i'm going to do it my own way like tied in by the relationship yeah it's like it comes with a set of rules and i don't I, those rules are better be my rules <laughs> <laughs> would you say that your family doesn't really need you to help them i think no i mean depends in the emotional arena i'm not the person to help them mm -hmm. but i'd say financially they need help mm -hmm. they're they, they they struggle financially pretty bad mm -hmm. and uh, it's hard for me to understand sometimes how bad financially they are struggling but then i just justify their financial struggles with their ability their inability to be able to generate income or manage their expenses mm -hmm. and so i would help them by not giving them money but teaching them to manage expenses or, you know, or generate more income. So it'll be lazy So provide more knowledge as it were next. Yeah. Provide time. more knowledge or sometimes get forceful if I need to, hmm. but my family, I don't have that close of a relationship with them. So it's not like it ever goes there. They don't ask me for advice. They just, hmm. they just kind of are. Hmm. So it's also things about you. You seem quite confident with the advice that you give. Is that something which you've always had? Yep. Hmm. It's funny because I, I, I try to, I believe that I'm pretty self-aware. So when I think of this, I'm confident in the way I deliver the advice, mm -hmm. but sometimes I know that it's not always right. Hmm. And I don't deliver it if it's not right, but then I realized say a day or two later, it wasn't the best advice, but it doesn't change my confidence the next time I do it. Hmm. It's like, I just feel like I know a subject and I'm going to go after it. And I'm going to let people know, here's the deal. Hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Um, let me see if I can think of just one last question to ask. Hmm. What, um, what would you say would be um, a bright future for you? And what would be a terrible future for you? A terrible future would be oh, not being stuck in a permanent state of inertia, not being able to experience life to the fullest because I'm stuck, being unsuccessful financially and have not having lived at all. That'd be a terrible future. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a, a bright future would be having the opposite of that, which is having obviously financial su success in the sense of being able to do the things that I want. When every time I think about how I want my own personal future to be, as mm -hmm. in what I'm doing, it's doing something 
that's developing other people or helping or aiding other people and being able to contribute to a career that I love because I'm independent and in the sense of I'm not, I don't work for anybody else. I definitely do not like working for people. Mm. And I, if I do work for people, I try to quickly move to the top. That's the, the thing I also want to do. So if I'm, if I'm in an organization, I better be at the top. That's going to be the bright future or mm. else it better be my own organization and I'm at the top. Definitely career. As far as career goes, that's I have to be at the top. I don't want to be anywhere else. And as far as personal life goes, as long as I have a successful relationship with my loved one, then I'm good there. And as far as recreationally, as long as I'm doing things all the time, it's just constantly in a state of activity. If I'm doing stuff, I'm good. If I'm sitting at home watching TV, being idle, I'm not good. I don't like that. Mm. And I, I understand that, I guess, sometimes you need it, but I don't. I really would like to stay busy the way that I kind of keep things, you know, I always have a to-do list every day of everything I'm trying to accomplish. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I stick my, hold myself accountable to my own goals. And this is the things I need to accomplish. These are the things I need to do. Here's how I'm going to get there. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. I think I just have one last question because you told me that you want to get into politics. What is your dream of, um, of a great future for United States of America? Well, that's a complicated question, and it, that can that can veer off into a long discussion. So I'm going to keep the answer simple, and if you need more detail, feel free to ask. But the, the, the answer is simple. As long as individual freedoms are not crossed, and as long as we don't move too far into a state in which I have to support other people with my own work mm. and too many other people to where I'm not reaping the own benefits. I'm very much capitalistic. So that's as long as that's intact and we stick to our constitution, I think we'll be okay. Hmm. Thank you very much for the interview, Chad. I, what I'm going to do now is um, take, off, take off broadcast, but we can continue to discuss because I think we have more to discuss, don't we, in terms of, um, well, in terms of the relationship counseling. So let's... Um, I'm going to stop the broadcast now and then we can um, continue. Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's fine.